Professor Baker, for many readers and listeners, I suspect that putting the wide span of your intellectual activities into context will be of great interest. Could we start with some general discussion of your early and continuing goals, as well as research strategies and methodologies? At what point in your career did you decide that legal history was your main area of interest? I don't remember ever making a conscious decision. If you, if you look, some of my earliest papers were on the law of contract, actually, because I thought I'd been appointed a lecturer in law, and that I should do some of that as well. But I was always interested in legal history from the start. I don't think I ever felt I understood anything legal unless I knew where it had come from and why. And no doubt agreeing to write a textbook on legal history was some sort of decision, so quite early on. I wondered how your interests evolved over the years. Was it opportunistic as you made various discoveries? Well, to some extent, although discoveries tend to be related to what you go out looking for. And I've recently had to go over a lot of the same manuscripts that I looked at 30 years ago looking for other things, and I didn't note them at the time because I wasn't working on those subjects then. So occasionally you make a discovery that's obviously going to be significant and takes you away from what you were thinking of, but mostly it's just a slog through sources. You've been extremely pro prolific, and I wondered what your technique was to pursuing a topic. Did you have periods of intense reading, uh, and then perhaps you, during a sabbatical, or were you able to do your writing interspersed with a lecture program? Well, there are two stages. Obviously, there's the collection of material, and then when you think you've got enough, there's trying to write it up and working out if you've got something worth saying. The collecting material had to be spread out over odd moments and intervals, precious visits to the public record office or the British Museum, or even the UL, sometimes difficult to get to in term time. Uh, and one just did that whenever one could. For writing up, it is a good idea to have a bit of extended peace and quiet if one can get it. So uh, vacations provided that. I didn't ever have that many sabbaticals, and they're not that conducive to the research stage because one is always tempted to go far away, and one is away from the sources. But they are very good for writing up because it's an advantage to be away from the sources and you don't go away chasing footnotes when you should be concentrating on the main writing. And the All Souls Fellowship was particularly helpful in that respect. I got a lot done there. Many or most of your works describe how you needed access to particular materials, for example, plea rolls, yearbooks, and a range of manuscripts. I wondered how quickly you managed to master the Latin and the law of French to translate such texts. Was a, I started with the printed yearbooks in the Inner Temple Library, as I mentioned previously. And it's as much a matter of understanding the abbreviations as the language. And eventually you realise it's all standardised and you come to know what the forms are. And my biggest learning period, I suppose, was editing Spellman, when I had to grapple with the law French and with the Latin of the plea rolls. And if you're editing something, you can't duck issues. You've got to translate every word, so you just have to keep at it until you've made sense of it. Eventually, I ended up writing a little glossary of law French because no one had done one before. It even went into a second edition. It doesn't have a vast readership. A feature of your works is your constant use of original research, even in your introductory book. And many start with the discovery of a manuscript this must have given you a strong intellectual base upon which to set your articles and your books. You are not just reinterpreting previous cases or other scholars' theories, but presenting completely fact-based observations upon which to base new ideas. And this place a lot, much of your work beyond dispute. It seems to me a very scientific approach, and I wondered whether this was a conscious strategy that you adopted throughout your career. I'm not sure I've ever had any conscious strategies. I've just got on and done it. Uh, did what was seemed obviously necessary to gather the evidence. And then I've always tried to stick to the evidence. I get accused of sticking too close to it and being an internalist and not taking enough account of what's going on outside the sources. 
but uh, yes, it has been, my work has been very largely based on manuscripts, what I find in them. Well, having settled on legal history as your chosen subject, can we briefly look at the early years of your research? I wondered whether you could tell us something about your first book, An Introduction to English Legal History, which appeared in 1971, and presumably you spent several years at UCL working on it, on this, on the sources for this book. Do your earliest papers give clues as to your thinking and your approach as they were written while the book preparation was ongoing? So the earliest paper that I found was published in 1968, when you were about 23 years old, a sixth copy of Blackstone's lectures published in the Law Quarterly Review. No, that was just a, an announcement of a find in the Law Library. The, the Law Library at UCL had just moved from the rather stately Donaldson Library into this warehouse-like building, and I think they probably decanted the contents of the store there as well, and this Blackstone manuscript turned up. It, it hadn't been in the old library. And I just took it to the issue desk and they stamped out the return date inside it. <laughs> I took it straight to Professor Keaton, the head of the department, and he said, you should put a note in the Law Quarterly Review. So that's what I did. But it wasn't a piece of research at all. But it was the start of a long and enthralling journey that you began. It, well, it showed an interest in manuscripts, I suppose. There were other papers, 12 papers, published during the gestation period of your book, your introduction to English legal history, and I wondered if they represented parallel projects or were they spin-offs from your research for the book? For example, the councillors and barristers, um, this was a paper on an aspect of the legal profession and there's also a section in your book on barristers. It's quite a short section, I think two pages. But the truth is I didn't do much research for the book, if, if any, because my object wasn't to set out the results of research, but to try to summarise very briefly what was known for the benefit of students. So the research was going on in parallel, and of course if I discovered something that seemed to be necessary in a brief outline, I put it in, but it wasn't designed to alter what I was saying. Later on, in subsequent editions, of course, uh, one finds a bit more uh, results of research that I've done, but that's inevitable. Incidentally, in your Irish Juris paper, you, you made a youthful conclusion, you were 25 years old at the time, that the 16th century battle between Cook and Ellesmere was more about personalities than equity in law, and I wondered whether this conclusion has stood the test of time. I think so, and I don't suppose anybody now believes that that dispute was about the need for equity, which it wasn't, and it was certainly a, a clash of personalities. It was also, I, I think, a, a constitutional crisis of a kind, and I've been exploring that in my latest book on Magna Carta. I think that was actually one of the best articles I ever wrote, and having revisited it 30 or 40 years later, I, I wasn't able to add very much to it. Uh, it was based in, and what sparked it off was the discovery of Timothy Turner's notebook in the British Museum, which had some very significant comments on what was going on in 1616. And that was a happy discovery. And I haven't found anything more telling since then on that particular subject. Just as an aside, your Funeral Monuments in the Air, published in the Irish Jurist in 1970, seems quite an esoteric topic. And I wondered what drew you to this in this early period of your research. Well, that was a, another tangential piece of work. Uh, obviously, it related to an early interest in monuments, but it wasn't an antiquarian piece. I, I was interested in the doctrine which Cook put forward, that the ownership of a funeral monument belongs to the person who put it up during their lifetime, and then it goes to the heirs of the person commemorated. And that seemed to me one of the most extraordinary doctrines in the common law, because it's, it's the only example of a remainder in real property by operation of law rather than by grant. And I wanted to know whether Cook had just made it up. That's what that was about. Right. But it stood alone as a subject. It doesn't really relate to anything else. 